Marvel movies have a long and rich history, but not all Marvel movies are created equal. Plenty have veered into unbelievable, dangerously stupid, or outrageous territory, seriously ticking off fans along the way. Here in the future, we have ample evidence that casting Ryan Reynolds as Deadpool was a pretty good idea. Good Deadpool. Unfortunately, that's about the last good idea that X-Men Origins Wolverine had when it came to everyone's favorite fourth wall breaking mercenary. Playing Deadpool as a handsome, mildly sarcastic member of a special ops team in a sleeveless t-shirt didn't quite line up with the comics, but it's understandable. The scene where he spins his katanas fast enough to deflect bullets is pretty ridiculous, but it's not so far past giving a guy unbreakable knives that pop out of his fist that we can't forgive him. No, the real problems here came when Deadpool returned at the movie's climax for what might just be the single worst fight in superhero movie history. Instead of the wisecracking badass that everyone wanted to see, Origins instead gave us a dollar store knockoff version of Baraka from Mortal Kombat and a pair of baggy sweatpants, covered in sharpie drawings of circuit boards. They managed to miss the point so badly that they literally took away Deadpool's mouth, something that's actually pretty important for a guy known for talking all the time. For both longtime fans and the people who wanted to see something even remotely cool, this guy was infuriating. The only good thing to come out of it was watching an infinitely better version of Deadpool, also played by Ryan Reynolds, shoot this dork in the head about a dozen times at the end of Deadpool 2. Spider-Man 3's version of Venom seemed like it was designed to make fans angry. Rather than standing on its own, the alien costume saga was lumped in as part of a bloated, confusing mess that also included a sad sack version of the Sandman and a sudden face turn by the second Green Goblin on a flying snowboard. That said, there's only one thing that comes to mind when you think of Spider-Man 3's excesses, the dance number. In the context of the film, it actually makes perfect sense. Thanks to the alien symbiote's influence, Peter Parker has given in to his darkest impulses and become an arrogant jerk. Since Peter himself is a huge nerd, that manifests as a huge nerd's idea of what a cool guy is like. He struts through the streets of Manhattan, pointing finger guns at hot ladies, and punctuates his sneering with sassy emo hair flips. The whole point of this sequence is that we're actually supposed to think that Peter's an off-putting, unlikable dweeb. There's a problem with that. It worked too well. The entire thing went way past the intended comedy and wound up being genuinely annoying. There are a lot of reasons to not like X-Men 3 The Last Stand, but for fans of the comic, there's one that sticks out above all others. Not only is Cyclops, the leader of the X-Men, killed off, but he goes out in the worst possible way, and the audience didn't even get to see it happen. The whole setup for this is mopey even by X-Men's soap opera standards. Understandably a little depressed after Jean Grey's apparent death at the end of X2, X-Men United, Scott Summers heads back to the site where she died in order to do some loud, laser-eyed mourning. Shockingly, for everyone who doesn't know that coming back from the dead is basically her entire deal, Jean returns and embraces Scott, who doesn't know that she has been possessed by the all-powerful, world-shattering Dark Phoenix. They make out for a minute, Scott's face gets all weird, and then we immediately cut to Professor X enduring an ice cream headache. And that's it. The founding member of the X-Men is done and dusted, presumably exploded to death off-screen. Looking back on it, it's even weirder. But at the time, it definitely felt like the filmmakers were punishing James Marsden for taking a role in the Superman movie that was coming out a month later. The first Fantastic Four movie sucked, but they still made a sequel because if you have a dozen eggs that are about to go bad, you might as well use them to make an omelet nobody wants. The second time around, audiences were promised the arrival of the Silver Surfer, which should have been a really big deal. After all, the Surfer isn't just a fan-favorite character, but he's also the Herald of Galactus, and his appearance on a planet is quickly followed by the arrival of the unfathomable, unstoppable Devourer of Worlds. The original Galactus story that ran in the comics back in 1966 was a groundbreaking, game-changing masterpiece that established the Fantastic Four as the kind of team that can deal with the threats that other heroes can barely even imagine. In the movie, though, it might top the list of the dumbest and most laughable things to ever appear in a superhero film. And yes, we're including the playground fight from Daredevil. Rather than going with the classic depiction of Galactus as a gigantic humanoid decked out in cosmic armor, the Devourer was a big hungry cloud, but it actually gets worse. In Marvel canon, Galactus isn't actually a humanoid. He's so far beyond our understanding that every species just interprets him as an incomprehensibly big version of themselves. So what does it say about us here in the real world that we had to see him as a gigantic space fart? 
In Captain America The First Avenger, we knew going in that Cap had to wind up being frozen for a few decades so he could show up to lead the Avengers in the present day. It's exactly what happens in the comics. For the film, though, it's not enough for Cap to sacrifice his life to save America from being bombed by Hydra. He also has to suffer a very personal loss that turns the whole scene into a weapons-grade tearjerker. His promise to meet Peggy Carter for a dance while they both know he's flying to his death is heart-wrenching and… hey, wait a second, they had autopilot in 1945, right? And even if they didn't, couldn't he just use his belt to tie down the control stick or just put it in a nosedive and bail out? He doesn't even need a parachute. Even if you weren't wondering that during the scene in question, Cap's final line of the film is so brutally emotional that we're angry that he didn't figure out a better way to save the world. You gonna be okay? Yeah. Yeah, I just... I had a date. Look, we appreciate Steve's heroic sacrifice, but Pecky waited so long, and... and... we just don't know what to do with these emotions. No one can deny that it would suck to be frozen for decades, only to be unfrozen and discover that everyone you ever cared about is either dead or way, way older than you are. So can anyone really blame Captain America for trying to move on after the death of former flame Peggy Carter? Listen, we like Steve Rogers enough that he probably could have gotten away with it, if only he hadn't decided to keep it in the family by dating Peggy's niece. Despite being one of Cap's long-lasting love interests in the comics, the fact that Sharon Carter was Peggy Carter's youngest relative gave fans a good reason to be weirded out by the sudden makeouts in Civil War. It even turned out that actress Haley Atwell, who played Peggy, wasn't really cool with it either. She told IGN that Peggy would be so angry if she caught Captain America making out with a woman who was about 70 years younger than he was that she might just become a supervillain from beyond the grave. It turned out the fans were definitely on Atwell's side, partly because Steve Rogers had way more chemistry with Bucky and Sam Wilson than he ever did with Sharon. At least either of those romances would have made sense. The infamous Mandarin twist of Iron Man 3 was either a piece of brilliant inspired comedy or just writer-director Shane Black's way of telling comic book fans that everything they've ever loved has been a stupid joke. You know who I am. You don't know where I am. And you'll never see me coming. The worst part was that it seemed like they'd been taunting comic book fans with the Mandarin all along, from the moment a terrorist organization called the Ten Rings was mentioned in the first Iron Man movie. Fans were primed to see the character who had been Tony Stark's arch-nemesis since 1964, but then came the big reveal. Bloody hell, bloody hell. Don't move. I'm not moving. You want something? Take it. Although the guns are all fake because those wankers wouldn't trust me with the real ones. What? It turned out that the Mandarin was just a drunk British actor named Trevor who'd been hired to draw attention away from the real villain. Saying that this version of the Mandarin was a departure from the comics is putting it mildly. While it definitely has plenty of humor, the scene where we find out that Iron Man's greatest comic book foe is just some dude felt a lot like going to a Batman movie and finding out the Joker was a guy with a part-time job at the circus. Even if it was done well, it's a huge letdown for fans. This is the Mandarin? I know, it's, it's, it's embarrassing. In Thor, the God of Thunder travels to Earth on the Bifrost, the rainbow bridge that connects Asgard to the rest of the Nine Realms. There, he has a completely chemistry-free romance with Jane Foster, and we're all supposed to feel super sad when he has to destroy the Bifrost in order to save Jotunheim, which has the side effect of making sure we'll never see Jane Foster again. That's not the bit that really outraged fans, though. That happened in the first Avengers movie, when Thor just totally showed up on Earth without using the Bifrost, making this whole great sacrifice seem like it was never really a big deal. How much dark energy did the Old Father have to muster to conjure you here? Your precious Earth. There is an attempt by Loki to explain the plot hole, but it just has the effect of making it clear that the Bifrost was never that important to begin with. Its destruction was apparently just an excuse for Thor to get out of his relationship with Jane. No wonder she dumped him. She didn't dump me, you know. I dumped her. It was a mutual dumping. The Marvel movies eventually did their best to patch this up, like the scene where we see Heimdall conjure up some Bifrost magic to send Hulk back to Earth in the opening of Infinity War. Still, it's not a whole lot better. And finding out the whole thing happens because of random magic weapons and not the magical bridge itself doesn't help much after years of having to live with an explanation that's even worse. Those horrible last moments of Infinity War can be traced back to a single event, 
And it's not any of the parts where Thanos gets his giant purple hands on the Infinity Stones. Instead, it's one of those scenes that makes you want to chuck your popcorn at the screen in anger. Alas, nothing you throw at the screen, no matter how delicious, will ever stop Star-Lord from punching Thanos in the face, thus making it possible for him to escape Mantis' control and to foil the hero's plan to take the gauntlet. Thanks for nothing, Quill. Okay, Quill, you gotta cool it right now, you understand? Don't, don't, don't engage, we almost got this off! The thing is, it's not a plot hole or bad writing. Peter Quill's rage at finding out that Thanos killed Gamora makes perfect sense, so the fans weren't outraged at the writers or the director. They were mad at Star-Lord himself, who was pretty much single-handedly responsible for the movie's upsetting conclusion. Check out one of our newest videos right here! Plus, even more grunge videos about your favorite superheroes are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.